Hello there, everyone, and welcome to Game Points episode 314. A weekly little get together where we talk about recent gaming news. I'm as always, your host, Jim Brown, and tonight we need to go over some of the highlights and no shows at the Xbox Bethesda conference. Saudi Arabia buys into Embracer Group, and Tactics Ogre's remake seemingly might have been leaked accidentally by Sony. We'll get into all to that and more, but first I want everyone to know this is an audience interactive podcast. If you're watching us live here at twitch.tv slash gamepoints, or later at any number of video hosting services, be it YouTube, Rumble, BitChute, etc., feel free to comment and join the conversation down below with any questions, comments, concerns, etc. you might have. Just try to keep them germane to the topics on hand. Oh, boy, do we have some stuff again too. Now, I get the feeling that I'm going to get a little angry on a couple of these topics here. Not not too over overdone because we've we've touched on them before, but it's important to point some things out. However, before I get into that, let's get into what is arguably the biggest thing so far this week, and that's the Xbox Bethesda Showcase that's happening. Now, yes, I know over the past week or so, we've had a whole bunch of conferences. And if you want to figure out what's in them, there are a myriad of other shows to get into. And to be honest, we're not even going to go into the entirety of the Bethesda Game Showcase here either. I just want to touch on a few highlights because it would be a problem if I don't. It, 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 this is the biggest news that happened, so I want to highlight a little bit of it. It's just kind of hard to talk about shows because we've all seen the show. You've all seen these recaps. What I want to focus on more, though, are things that weren't at this Xbox showcase. Don't worry. We'll talk about some of the good things that I saw as well, a couple highlights on the call out. But I'm really concerned for the state of Microsoft based on what was not there. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not sitting here saying that Xbox is in trouble or anything like that. But I do think it is uh, an organizational chaos going on behind the scenes. And the fact that we haven't heard from so many projects, all of which have been announced. They're the same concerns I have for Ubisoft, for example, with a lot of their missing no-shows. But to give you an idea of what was not at the Xbox Bethesda Game Showcase was Perfect Dark. No word on what's happening there. Avowed. Fable. I mean, keep in mind, these are games that are announced more than a few years ago, and you can blame COVID to some degree, but after a while, you kind of have to produce something. Uh, Indiana Jones, Hellblade 2, Contraband, Everwild, State of K3, Outer Worlds 2, The Elder Scrolls. Uh, admittedly, The Elder Scrolls was just a little teaser, and they did say this is going to be, like, I think they said 2026 at the earliest, but it bears bringing up in here. Uh, to kind of also get on the little bit of the train about things that they are announcing way too early, if not for the show... Todd Howard did come out to say today, of all things, that Fallout 5 is going to be the next game after Elder Scrolls 6, which is going to be the next game after Starfield, which means Fallout 5, expect that sometime in 2032. Uh, this is a problem. They need to... Everyone. When I say they, I'm not just referring to Microsoft here. I'm referring to everyone. Stop announcing your shit years before it comes out. It leads to an uncontrolled hype train, and you will never be able to match the expectations the audience sets in mind themselves. Uh, let's see. Stealthy Twitch in chat says, Starfield equals No Man's Skyrim. We'll definitely get into that for sure toward the end of this segment here. I do want to mention that. All these games have been announced. We haven't heard from any of them beyond their announcements. And as I said earlier, yes, I get, I understand that COVID was a thing and that really screwed up a lot of production for a lot of people. But we are at a point now where we cannot blame all of this on COVID anymore. We can't. It's, it's, there is chaos going on behind the scenes, in my opinion, at Xbox. There is seemingly mismanagement in the fact that we haven't even heard anything from any of this stuff, but they're still teasing things that are coming out like as late as 2023, which is next year, which makes me think a lot of these games that I mentioned aren't even going to be in 2023, and if they are, they'll be late 2023. And it's also why I think Microsoft is buying Activision Blizzard, or at least one of the reasons. Yes, you have their wealth of IP. You get all Blizzard catalog, you get Call of Duty, you get you get a lot of stuff when it comes to IP. But I think, and this is just me speculating, I could be totally wrong on this. I think one of the main things that Microsoft wanted from this deal was the personnel. Because uh, Activision Blizzard is a massive company that 
that employs a whole bunch of people, they can immediately start putting those people to work on some of these games that were not shown at the Xbox, but there's the game showcase. They can start putting them to work on Fable or Indiana Jones or Perfect Dark or whatever the next year's thing might be. And finally start cranking some of this stuff out because at the moment, and I know this sounds ludicrous to say given the size of Microsoft, but it really feels like Xbox might have bitten off more than they can chew. And they seem to be a bit overwhelmed with how many projects they currently have in active development right now. And I think they need more than the IP, more than the existing games, more than, than anything else is the support structure from Activision Blizzard. That's my opinion on it, though. That's my take on it. I think that is one of the main reasons why they picked them up, though. I am starting to get concerned about a lot of these. None of these more than Perfect Dark and Fable. Perfect Dark, we've heard about how they've had to bring in another team to help work on it. Uh, Crystal Dynamics, I think it was. I think it was Crystal Dynamics. Fable, we haven't seen anything on in years and that's already a franchise that's known for some some bloat but the Peter Molyneux days are long behind us I am concerned and I hope I hope that they're doing that thing that I do I know it sounds a little bit hypocritical but I hope they're doing that thing that I want them to do where they don't say a damn thing about any of these games until it's like less than six months to come out and then just wow us with all kinds of stuff and they go here's a date that's four months from now or five months from now but I don't think that is the case at all. I don't think that's the case at all. I do think it's chaos. I think it's some mismanagement. And I think that there is a bunch of major, major developmental issues going on behind the scenes. And yes, also COVID. I get that's the thing. Let's take a look at chat here before we move on. Blizzard is such a poison pill for Microsoft to swallow with Diablo Immortal being the crescendo of the train wreck they're buying. I don't... I don't know if I would classify Blizzard as a poison pill because there's no way that... I mean, the Blizzard, Activision Blizzard's reputation was already sullied before the Microsoft deal. That said, it's only progressively gotten worse. And I do have to wonder if Microsoft were to think about buying them today, if they would reconsider that. Because it is coming along with a lot of baggage. But I do think that Microsoft can... I don't necessarily want to say right the ship with Blizzard because at the end of the day, I don't think they're going to be that different, but hopefully they can keep more of their avarice in check. I know that's weird to say about Microsoft being, well, Microsoft, but I think since they're going to be pushing Games Pass so hard that that might change the way some of the monetization and future Blizzard games go. Uh, Diablo Immortal, by the way, just to be 100% clear, was never meant for a North American audience. It was meant for the Chinese market, who love that kind of game. They just released it in North America because why the hell not? It does, however, give yet another, uh, uh, another black eye to an already battered company, and rightfully so, because Diablo Immortal's monetization system is, as I kept saying last week over and over again, egregious at best. That's what wasn't at the show. We do have a whole bunch of things that were at the show. Like I said, I'm not going to get into all of them, but there are a couple of them that I want to do point out. We're going to go through these somewhat quick. One thing I want to point out, Hollow Knight Silk Song will be launching soon and will be day one on Game Pass. It, they didn't give an exact date for it, but when you say launching soon, I'd imagine within the next two months, they're probably just trying to figure out the good release date for it and they could be putting on some financing touches. It could be one of those things when they go, okay, it's done, and then they announce it comes out like two weeks later. I, I can't say for certain. But I would imagine to have that game before the end of August, when they say launching soon. One of the things they mentioned, and I think this is getting underreported. I'm not hearing too many people really go into depths at all about this. Uh, and I won't be either, because I, I don't know much about this game. But Riot Games is joining a partnership with Microsoft, and they're going to be bringing League of Legends, which is a free-to-play game. But if you have Game Pass, all the champions of that game will be unlocked. Along with Valorant, with the same kind of deal there as well. Team Fight Tactics, Foundations, Legends of Runeterra. If you have Game Pass, all of that paid content will just be unlocked for you naturally. That is huge in terms of Game, of game Pass support. They're all games that I don't play, so I'm not going to get too deep into here. But that is one of those things that you look at 
And I think it is more important than people are giving it credit for. Let's take a look at chat here. It's my throat's already drying out. Not even, not even 10 minutes into the show. In fact, I'm going to meet myself for two seconds. Let's see. Chat asks, of all the games highlighted, which one ones I'm personally most anticipating? Uh, if we're talking about everything at the Summer Game Fest in general, the Callisto Protocol. Uh, Callisto Protocol looks amazing, and I am really, really excited for it. If we're talking specifically the Xbox Bethesda Games Conference, Starfield, but I have my reservations about it, and we'll get into that soon. Uh, other things of note, Overwatch 2 going free to play and will be in early access come October 4th, 2022. I also expect that if Overwatch has any monetization when it comes to heroes, they haven't yet. But if they do, I'd expect the Game Pass treatment to do the same thing. We just get those for free. Scorn gets a brand new gameplay trailer. It's going to be releasing October 21st, day one on Game Pass. Scorn is that HR Geiger inspired first person shooter, a game that I want to be good but I don't think it's going to be. Uh, if you take away the weirdness of its atmosphere, it really does kind of just look, you know, I got strong Quake 4 vibes to it. A game that was a launch game on the Xbox 360. And it's a game that strikes me that it is catering to its style more than its substance. I could be wrong on that. I am going to take a look at it when it comes out. I am looking forward to getting my hand into it. But I am not drooling over it like I once was. If anything, what I saw at the showcase was anti-hype. I, I, I can't put my finger on it. But it does just look kind of eh. Uh, however, something that didn't look eh. The last case to Benedict Fox. This had, this had me written all over it. It's a 2.5D side-scroller. It's a mystery game. It's coming out sometime next year during the spring. Once again, day one on Game Pass. I don't know much about it, but I am sold. I have been looking for a decent mystery game. I haven't had too many investigative games, and I, I it's it's there's a hole in my catalog that I need to fill, and I'm hoping this fills it. Diablo 4 has some more information come out. New cinematic trailer. Yeah, we we know Blizzard can make a good cinematic trailer. Uh, they're going to be bringing back the Necromancer as their final class, at least at launch for Diablo 4. I would not be surprised if they released other classes later on. That will be coming sometime in 2023. My gut tells me late 2023. I am excited for Diablo 4. My issues with Diablo Mortal aside, my issues with Activision Blizzard aside, I am going to play Diablo 4. Call me a hypocrite or not, I get that. I personally think that it is impossible these days to actually be a gamer and, and be 100% moralistic because everyone has everyone's fingers in each other's pies. We'll talk about that with Saudi Arabia later. That said, I am... I look at Diablo 4 and I I'm excited for it but it's the same excitement that I had for Diablo 3 before that launched and for those of you who were able to play Diablo 3 when it first launched it was a significantly different beast than it is now Diablo 3 was uh, a train wreck to say the least look up the real world money auction house if you want to know how bad Diablo 3 was at launch now that game Diablo 3 eventually got better I like Diablo 3 now. I'm hoping Diablo 4 builds off of that and doesn't do that thing that so many games do where they kind of get rid of all the good shit from the predecessor and keep all the bad. And uh, I'm hoping that doesn't happen here. So I am excited, but I have been burnt by that excitement before when it comes to Diablo. Other quick highlights. Persona 3, 4, and 5 are all coming to Xbox and PC some uh, October 21st. Awesome. Love those games. Uh, Kojima said he's working with Xbox on something. I thought they would be showing whatever Overdose is, and they didn't. So who the hell knows exactly what Overdose is? And I thought they'd even go about it later in the week, but they didn't do that either. But there's really not much more to say other than Kojima and Xbox are working on something. And then finally, we got our first look at Starfield. Uh, Starfield. Oh boy, oh boy. What, what, what can I say about Starfield that anyone already hasn't? I saw it, and yes, uh, stuff at Twitch in chat said earlier it was No Man's Skyrim. 100% agree. I got strong, strong No Man's Sky vibes from this, and that is not a good thing there, guys. Uh, it, it looked a little janky, too. It looked dated. There were some moments where that game looked very, very cool, 
But as that, that what was it, like 10, 15 minutes of gameplay was going on, I kept looking at it going, wow, this is just Fallout 4 again. A game that came out years ago and was already dated feeling then. This trailer did not do too much for me to really hype me up for Starfield. It just looked... It looked old hat. It looked like Bethesda game. And we all know what Bethesda game is. It's very similar to Ubisoft game. You know what I'm talking about. I want this to be good. But when I hear things about how the development of this is just running like a hog on some things, especially the space combat, when it gets delayed out of a golden release date, it's hard to stress how important release dates are. And when you had a golden release date of 11, 11, 22, that nice numbering system on there, it takes a lot to get for it, to let marketing go of that, of something like that. So this game had to have been in a really rough shape. Still no release date on it other than a generic 2023 date. Yes, I'm aware I keep hitting my mic with my chin. <laughs> uh, it will be day one on Game Pass. I just don't know. Uh, I, I'm watching this trailer and you see the, the health bar with the lever next to them, as every game seems to do now as they all incorporate various RPG elements. Admittedly, this is an RPG, so I can't hard it too much against them. I see the, the fallout S perk system that was in the previous fallout games i see a lock picking mini game it's like guys i mm, i want to like this but it, it feels like i could probably just play eld uh, skyrim again and get the same experience and that's not good furthermore something that actually turns me off to this game is they came out and they said that there's going to be over a thousand planets to explore Cool. Sounds great at first. How many players planets are going to have anything of consequence on them? A hundred? Fifty? Twenty? When I hear a thousand planets, what I hear is the Radiant Quest system from Skyrim. Just procedurally generated content that is little more than kill ten of X. Or find five Y. Or kill this random boss at the end of here. That was boring. And I don't trust Bethesda Game Studios to give me anything other than that on 990 of these planets. And that really buns me out about Starfield. I, I, am, I am more concerned about that game now than I was last week. And I, I hate that because I want it to be good. Let's take a look at chat here. Penitent has piqued my interest, mostly because it's an Obsidian passion project. The art style is also alluringly indicative of the subject matter. Yeah, uh, Penitent, if I recall, was like a... Oh, man, how would I describe that to people who didn't see it? Like, it's, it's a narrative... Was it a mystery game set like in the 16 or 1700s? I think you're an Inquisitor or something. I'm trying to remember. I can I can picture the art style in my head. I can picture someone like burning at the stake in my head, but I don't remember the details of it. I will say I was surprised to see that Obsidian was doing that because Obsidian, to me, is still an RPG factor. Yes, I know that they had Grounded, which is coming out of Early Access later this year, and they're working on this, but to me, they're still Fallout New Vegas team. A Cutter 2 team. So it's just weird to see them working on something like this. Uh, that could be cool, though. It's different, and I fully support different. Anyways, let me know if you guys saw anything of oh, the Xbox Bethesda Game Showcase or just in general over the past week during Keeley's Summer Game Fest that you really saw and were super hyped up about or very worried about. To me, I didn't see anything really at all that was a big surprise. There was some good stuff, especially on the indie scene, but there was no blow away moments. There's no Shenmue 3 has been announced, even though no, no one played that game. There was no like, oh my God, this is happening. There was no Keanu Reeves behind the, the curtain waving to everyone saying he's going to be the main character of Cyberpunk. Admittedly, we know how that turned out, but there wasn't any big needle movers at this thing. And it's kind of sad. However, 
I do think that this month of game announcements is not over yet. I think there's going to be some things that we haven't seen yet. I am fully expecting Sony to do some kind of show, not just a 15 minute state of play, but like an hour long showcase of some kind. I expect that to happen either at the end of this month or the beginning of July. Same with Nintendo. I do expect them to do a direct uh, by the end of this month or early July. And we'll get some more news about that likelihood happening later in the show as well. Anyways, let me know what you guys think about the Summer Game Fest down in the comments below, regardless of where you're at or over at our Discord server. All right, let's move on to this next topic here. I'm not too happy about this one, but what you're going to do? This is via IGN. Saudi Arabia buys $1 billion game share, a share of giant gaming group Embracer. Uh, I don't like this. The Swedish giant gaming group Embracer has had a $1 billion in shares purchased by Saudi Arabia. Embracer is the parent company to numerous publishing and development studios like THQ Nordic, Saber Interactive, and Gearbox Entertainment. Once the deal is completed, Saudi Arabia's public investment fund, the PIF, via its subsidiary, Savvy Gaming Group, will be the second largest owner of Embracer Group shares. According to a press release from Embracer, this will give Savvy an approximately 8.1% of the shares and 5.4% of the votes in the company. I don't like this. Uh, Saudi Arabia is a extremely oppressive place where they actively behead people for crimes. Uh, they recently beheaded something like 100 plus people not all that long ago. The crown prince that runs this fund uh, is alleged to have murdered a journalist uh, they treat women and minor uh, religious minorities in their country just horribly. Some of that is punishable by death. Uh, they are, it's not a good country. And it, the Saudi royal family specifically is extremely authoritarian. And I know that this crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman, is getting, uh, it is considered a reformer. But... He's also the one that seems to be per allegedly, I'll say, responsible for the death of that journalist, uh, Khashoggi, I believe his name was. So I don't like this at all. And I don't like the, that Saudi Arabia is investing in more and more game companies. For example, SNK was one of them, and they're starting to really stretch their legs out. I don't like it. Uh, I think I might hate it more than Tencent buying up things. Back to the article. In the press release, Lars Wingfor, CEO of Embracer, said, Our relationship with Savvy Gaming Group will enable us to set up a regional hub in Saudi Arabia from which we will be able to make investments across the MENA region, either organically via partnerships, joint ventures, or acquisitions of companies led by strong entrepreneurs. So they see Saudi Arabia as a gateway to the rest of the Middle East. Middle East and North Africa. That's what MENA is, I believe. PIF is a fund created, chaired by Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman. Prince Salman's goal is to make the country less dependent on oil. Early last year, he invested billions in stocks of Take-Two, EA, and Activision Blizzard, and also acquired the world's biggest esports companies for $1.5 billion. I get wanting to make your country less dependent on one good, because if that one good goes kaboom, your country is fucked. I get it. I also don't know if, and if someone knows this answer, please let me know. I don't know if you're a public trade company, if you can refuse someone buying your shares. I don't think you can. Uh, now, I am sure that the Crown Prince made a deal to get these shares, the, the this 8.1% of all the shares, at a discount because he is buying such a massive bulk figure. But it doesn't change the fact that I don't like this. And I think it is important to be calling out the human rights abuses of Saudi Arabia any time any of the games from Embracer or Take Two or EA or Activision Blizzard or SNK comes up. Uh, much like how I think it's important to do the same with Tencent. We need to keep these topics in our minds and we need to keep them at the forefront of the conversation because if we just forget about it, uh, I mean, what am I going to say, right? What am I going to say? Wilson well, Corner in chat says, as much as I don't like Saudi Arabia, at the very least, Saudi is very hands off on their foreign investments. So, it'll be, so at least unlike China, we shouldn't be seeing any major censorship. You are correct on that, Wilson. Uh, Saudi Arabia does tend to keep hands off. But it is one of those things where if you want to look at it from a different level, that means that you are, if you're playing any 
an Embracer Grant game or Take Two game or EA game, you are indirectly funding the actions of a country that is horrible shit. However, counter to that, if you want to take that logic and apply it to any number of countries out there, we all do egregious shit. America has its fair share of horrible shit we've done in the past. So does the UK. So does Germany. So does China. So does Japan. So does Russia. We've all done horrible shit. All of our governments are fucked up in some way, shape, or form. Uh, but the difference, I guess, is is that this crown prince in particular seems to be an unsavory character. And there is a weird point where you can be so many levels removed from something. Because you can connect every bad actor to everything. Because they control it all. But there's a certain less number of steps of distance between, say, eating the burger at McDonald's and supporting conflict diamonds or some shit like that. You know what I'm saying? Uh, a bad example, but I think you get what I mean. In this case, it's an it's like a two jump difference. I buy game from SNK. SNK makes money. Crown Prince makes money. Crown Prince beheads journalists. <laughs> so. Uh, it, it breaks the veil a little bit. It breaks the veil. And there comes a point where you just have to kind of go enough. And I know some people who are just straight up saying, hey, I am not playing SNK games anymore. And now they're probably not buying because they might play Embracer because there's still between 5% and 100% of the company. But it, it's just not good. And I hate it. And I don't think there's any way around it. I don't think there's any way around it at all. This is just you just have to accept that no matter what you're buying, you're going to fund some egregious shit somewhere. Uh, anyways, what, what more can I really, really get into it? Uh, the, the deal hasn't gone unnoticed, by the way. There are people talking about it to the point where the Embracer CEO had to actually issue a statement on it. This here from Embracer, or, uh, your gamer, rather. Lars Wingfors, the boss of Embracer Group, has issued a lengthy statement discussing the recent 840 million pound investment in the company between Sephora Gaming Group. I will read this in its entirety because I, w I want his words to come across for all of you. Give me one second. Really dry throat today. Couldn't tell you why. To the statement. Since our announcement two days ago regarding the investment by Savvy Gaming Group, I have received many questions. Wingford's lengthy statement begins. I would like to share some background and provide to you a rationale for our decision. I understand and respect there are different views on this topic, and I don't claim to have the right answers, but I want it to be clear that this decision was not taken lightly. I appreciate the opportunity to explain my view on why this investment is an important step for Embracer on our continued journey as a company. Uh, I want to say right here, when you say... It, it, <laughs> there are some conversations where you can go, I understand and respect that there are different views on this topic is a valid thing. But when you're saying, I understand that there are different views on this topic over this crown prince motherfucker allegedly assassinating a journalist. Uh, let's not try to sugarcoat that. Say, it's just, just come out and say what you're doing here, guys. Back to the article and back to the statement. I want to be clear that Embracer will continue to be operated by me, our operative CEOs, and management teams across the entire group. Embracer is built on the principles of freedom, inclusion, humanity, and openness. The transaction with SGG will not change this in any way. Uh, once again, they say that, but all you have to do is take a look at any social media from any major company during June. You look at their Twitter feed, and all of them change their logos to have some variant of the rainbow flag back there for gay pride. And then you look at their Middle East division and they haven't done anything at all. So clearly, that does affect your principles of freedom, inclusion, and humanity, and openness. You change them depending on what market you're in. So this also rings hollow in the light of all that. Back to the statement. I have been asked over the past few days why we are accepting investment from an ent ent entity in a non-democratic country, he concluded. He continued. To start, we need to look ourselves in the mirror. We're a public company and already have many hundreds of institutions from all parts of the world as shareholders, including investors from the Middle East and Africa and Asia region. Many of them have participated on the capital raising during the past years, and many others have joined during the open market. So essentially, he's saying, hey, we've, we're already trading with some shady shit. So what's a little bit more? 
During the process, we have learned the SGG parent, PIF, is one of the world's largest investors, including sizable ownership in many of our larger gaming peers, as well as a lot of other things, too. If you want to be blown away by, by, by just how many things the PIF has invested in, go take a look at their portfolio. It is surprising what they're all invested in. We generally believe that SGG, a fully commercial entity, has ambitions from gaming that are genuine supporting the global ecosystem for our industry and are consistent with important consistent with and important to the values of the culture of our industry. SGG is providing a sizable, truly long-term capital investment to support our strategy and management so that we may continue the successful growth of our commercial business. My values as a Swedish entrepreneur are unwavering. We are a value-based company, and our commitment to a decentralized operating model that empowers great people to make their own decisions will always remain. I don't know, man. When you, when you, I hate going to. The, so I won't. I'll use something different. If he was dealing with, say, Fidel Castro or Manuel Noriega or any of the other strong men throughout history, uh, Nikolai Ceausescu. Would the statement cut the mustard? No, it wouldn't. So fuck this. Just say what say what say what you're doing, Wing Fours. You're taking money from a despot who loves video games because it's a shit ton of money. At least I'd feel like you're being honest with me. And yes, you might maintain your morality in Sweden and Europe and North America and South America. But you sure as shit are compromising it in the Middle East, aren't you? You're not changing your logo to the pride flag in the Middle East, are you? You're not extolling the virtues of women's rights in the Middle East, are you? So take your empty platitudes and go to hell. Just, just say, just say, just say it. I would rather you be honest and go, he gave us a shit ton of money. Yeah, he's a dick. Gave us a shit ton of money, so we took it. I'm still not going to like it, but at least I feel like you're not trying to blow smoke up my ass. And that's... I think that's all I got to say about that. Let me know what you all think about this statement down below, too. I, I want to know if I am just out on a limb here or or if people are actually kind of thinking the same thing I do at this point. Because... This sucks, and I don't think so much to about it, but we don't have to pretend that this is just normal either. We don't. I have one more news story about Saudi Arabia, oddly enough, uh, and this is from Arab News, a site I have never used before. By the way, links to all these stories will be provided down below, regardless of where you're watching at, or at our Discord server. Yeah, it is a, uh, let's see. Chat is saying, about the dichotomy of Middle Eastern corporate Twitter and Western corporate Twitter. There's this thing called the EGS score. It's a standard created by one of the biggest, yeah, I, I know about EGS scores. I'm not going to go into that, you would say it quite correctly, a rabbit hole. I am not going to go into the environmental, social, and governance score <laughs> system here. I am already conspiracy theory driven to begin with, and that I can be here for like an hour talking about. And we, Not related to the topics on hand, but yes, I do know very much about ESG scores. Uh, headline. I found this kind of interesting. Saudi Arabia to host the world's biggest esports and gaming event this summer via Arab News. Uh, there we go. Gamers 8, the world's biggest esports and gaming event, is taking place for eight weeks in the summer in Riyadh. It's being held at the state-of-the-art purpose-built venue at the Riyadh Boulevard City from July 14th to September 8th, and with some of the world's top players taking part. Hosted on the theme of Your Portal to the Next World, the action will fold alongside festivals, concerts, shows, and other events. The competition will be consisted across six different titles, with up to 15 million in the prize pool up for grabs. Prince Faisal bin Badar bin Sultan, my apologies if I mispronounced that, chairman of the Saudi Esports Federation, said the following. With an, estimated, with an estimated 23.5 million gamers across the country, almost every home in the kingdom has someone with a deep passion for gaming. This passion for gaming has long been a source of pride for the Saudis. Organized by Saudi Esports Federation, Gamers 8 will focus on four main pillars, professional esports, festivals, music, and the Next World Summit, which is an esports and gaming conference that will bring together sector leaders and experts from around the world. This is kind of... I know I just went on this rant about how corrupt the Crown Prince is and about how the Saudi royal family does some horrible shit. But that doesn't change the fact that the people of Saudi Arabia, 
Uh, I, I've interacted with a couple of them. They seem very nice people. Uh, and, I mean, we all like playing games. This is one of those things that it's interesting to see a country slowly opening up a little bit, too. And I guess that's one of the things you could say is a positive about the influx of gaming culture into the country. Because the, uh, the Crown Prince, the head of the PIF, is a huge gamer. He's, he's not just someone that sees money and is buying into it. From, from all reports, the man loves his games. And with any luck, the influx of gamer culture might modernize that country a little bit. That was the hope with China when China relations between the U.S. and China opened up in the 60s and 70s. Didn't really work out there, so I don't have too much faith in that idea. But I wanted to point this out. Because it is interesting to see a prominent Middle East country have a gaming festival. And that could be just a lack of knowledge to Middle Eastern culture on my part. I will fully admit that. But hopefully, hopefully, while it sucks to have these terrible people making investments, specifically the, the, the leads of, of the Saudi Arabian government and the royal family, I'm not saying the citizens of Saudi Arabia, to see horrible people making money off of gaming, it might also pave the way to a cultural renaissance in some of these countries. We'll see. But that, I wanted I wanted to bring that up because it's it's very much ingrained in Saudi Arabia now, gaming, and it's it's not something that's just a cash cow for them. And hopefully, that brings about some positive change there. We'll see. That's the theory, anyways. Let's do a hard shift to a couple of other topics here. This is via the Escapist, and I do mean a hard shift. Tactics Ogre Reborn is apparently leaked on the PlayStation Store. This is more or less confirmed at this point. Tactics Ogre Reborn, by the way, if you guys remember, was part of the big NVIDIA leak that happened a few months back, where they had all these upcoming games that were supposedly not announced yet, just given out to the, the masses as someone went into... I don't really know the details of how they got that information, but it was it was on the back end somewhere and someone was able to access it. On that list was a Tactics Ogre remake. Well, it seems the PlayStation Store accidentally leaked it to the article itself from The Escapist. Tactics Ogre Reborn has leaked to the listing on the PlayStation Store. Square Enix has trademarked Tactics Ogre Reborn in Japan this past March, so this is confirmation that the game exists. The new PlayStation Store listing has no, long, no pricing or release date details, nor does it provide any real details about what the game actually is. Instead, it just offers the game's name, the game's icon art, right there, gorgeous promotional art, further below, right there, and the fact that it's a role-playing game for Square Enix. However, by looking at the leaked art in the PlayStation Store, it is clear Tactics Ogre Reborn is either a remaster or a remake of the original Tactics Ogre. Uh, they did take this down, I believe. They weren't wanting to announce this just yet. But, hey, sometimes someone hits the wrong button and something goes live. I am super excited for this. I never got a chance to play Tactics Ogre, and it is also now one of those games that is worth a shit ton of money if you want the original. I know there's, like, Let Us Clean Together on the PSP, but I don't have a PSP. What you want to do? I'm looking forward to playing through this. Very excited for it. And it just shows that sometimes even the publishers themselves can accidentally let something slip. Next up on here from Eurogamer, EA refutes new report claiming Battlefield 2042 development mode is now in an abandoned ship mode. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Battlefield 2042 came out last year and it's been pretty goddamn disastrous. Uh, issues abound throughout the game. We've talked about in the past. Long story short, it is a sinking ship that players are abandoning left and right. And they keep promising that they're going to give out updates, but they've been few and far between. Recently, I believe it was Jeff Grubb came out and said, hey, EA shutting this thing down. They're going to crank out what they're legally obligated to for their promises, and then they're going to kill it just like they did Anthem. EA here is saying, no, we're not. We're going to support the game. It's going to be supported for a while. I'm going to come out right now and say, bullshit. EA is going to Anthem this bitch. Hard. They have to say this, though, as long as they're still making content for it because they want to make as much money as they can off of it. To the article itself. EA has responded to new claims Battlefield 2042 has entered an abandoned ship mode, insisting reports of the only a skeleton crew is left working on the beleaguered shooter are untrue, end quote. The thing about using the term skeleton crew is that can mean anything to anyone. 
what Grubb's version of Skeleton Crew might be A saying, hey, it's slimmed down, but it's not a Skeleton Crew. It's subjective. So they can call it untrue all they want to. doesn't mean the fact that I believe they are winding this game's production down. Word that Battlefield 2042's post-launch development has been dramatically downscaled was first showed by journalist Jeff Grubb on his Grubb Stack Giant Bombshell, where he claimed the remaining team had been tasked with delivering four seasons of live service content promised to purchasers in the, quote, fastest and cheapest way it possibly can. The game is basically down to a skeleton crew, Tub Grubb told his viewers. It's down to the bare bones, and those people are specifically just working on the promised additional seasons the game needs to meet the requirements of the high-end version that it sold. Because that could potentially lead to some lawsuits later on. So you're going to get a bunch of shit pushed out quickly, cheaply, and ineffectively to actually drive more people back to that game. Describing this situation as abandoned ship time, Grub said the remaining team is working to pump that stuff out the fast, cheapest as possible can so that everyone can be moved to the new battlefield as fast as possible. The real core of the battlefield developers are already working on that. Responding to Grubb's claims that the statement provided to Eurogamer, EA called the report untrue, insisting that, quote, there is a significant team at DICE alongside other studios focused on evolving and improving Battlefield 2042's experience for all players. If that is the only bit of the statement they put on there, of course it's untrue. Remember, companies do not give hard data unless it is positive for them. If they had some positive news to go along with this, they would have mentioned it. They would have given out specific details about what's coming up. They would have given out numbers of people working on it. They would get out a percentage of a team still working on it to help assuage fears that this game is in, quote, abandoned ship mode. They didn't do that. So I don't trust them. I don't trust them for one goddamn thing. Uh, apparently, Battlefield 2042 is 50% on Steam right now as of June 14th. Uh, so if you're wanting to play a busted ass game for half off, now's the time to do it, I guess. This game is going to be abandoned. EA abandoned shit all the time. Once again, I've referenced Anthem. Just look no farther than that. They're going to have a skeleton crew working on it to use the verbiage that Grub used. And then eventually go, all right, it's time. We've met our legally required content that we sell to people. Shut it down. They might keep the servers on for a year or two after with no support beyond that. And then eventually they'll pull the plug on that. And Battlefield 2042 will be a long forgotten memory because the gamers have the memory span equivalent to that of a Mayfly. What more can I say other than don't pre-order? And not only don't pre-order, but wait. In any kind of big game like this, Wait two weeks before it come, after it comes out before you buy it. Don't even trust reviews. Don't even trust people playing it on Twitch or YouTube pre-release. Wait for the game to come out. Put those servers under a proper stress test. See what issues thousands to tens of thousands of people have when it comes out. And then make a decision. I am so glad I didn't buy this. Because I almost did. I almost pulled the trigger on it. And I went, you know what? I have been burned by these games before in the past so i am just going to wait two weeks and then sure enough that saved me 60 or 70 bucks because this is a goddamn disaster do not give companies your money if they do not respect you as a player and battlefield 2042 does not respect your time does not respect your your worth as a gamer and it does not respect anything about the dollars that you have thrown at it and by extension, apply that to anything else that anyone does at this point. Stop getting games on day one. They've all been busted. And this goes beyond Battlefield 2042. There is the obvious cyberpunk that we can point into. There is No Man's Sky that we can point into. There is a myriad of issues that have happened specifically over the past few years. It feels like there hasn't been a major AAA release that has released over the past two or three years that has not had not just slight issues, but major, major problems. We collectively need to go enough. We need to start looking at, and I know that we need is code for I want, but I want people to start looking at these companies with far more cynicism, far less trust, and more of a weary eye in the future. So that way they can actually go, you know what, we should probably, probably make sure this game is 100% polished before we ship it out because I'm tired of, of playing shit 
day one that's actually in early access. I am. I, I've just had it with, with, with major things. Uh, let's see. Let's look at chat here. Sunny first party titles have been really solid in terms of release things like Spider-Man Horizon. I will agree with you on that. Sunny first party has had a very successful time with with their games when it comes to running just fine. Uh, say what you will about The Last of Us 2. Some people love it. Some people hate it. But that game looks gorgeous and runs well. Same with Horizon. Same with Spider-Man. Same with Death Stranding. But they are kind of the exception that proves the rule. Because they dump so much production into their big first party titles because they want you to buy they want you to buy systems from them. I have two more stories. They're kind of shorter, but let's go ahead and get into them. First up right here, I do not like reporting on this stuff because I think most of the time it's bullshit, but considering who said it, I'm willing to accept this. Via Video Game Chronicle, the next Nintendo Direct is coming at the end of June, at least it's been claimed. Game writer and former journalist Alana Pierce seems certain of the date. And the reason why I am willing to run with this one is, well, let me get to the details of the story. During a recent Twitch stream, she's reacting to the Xbox with us to showcase Santa Monica, Sony Santa Monica writer and former games journalist Alana Pierce said that the next Nintendo Direct is coming June 29th. She was asked by a viewer if a Nintendo Direct has been announced, to which she replied, no, but I believe there's a Nintendo Direct coming on the 29th. And then she goes and looks like at her calendar and says, Yep, I have it written down on the 29th. So someone with inside knowledge told her that, and then she kind of goes, eh, no one from Nintendo told me this, so it's not a leak. I don't care. This sounds about right. Nintendo is due for a Nintendo Direct. June 29th makes perfect sense. It's far enough away from Keeley's thing to keep from being associated with it because Nintendo kind of wants to have their own control on it. If it was just someone coming out saying, oh, yeah, it's for 29th, that's one thing. But an impromptu being asked for it, you see her looking through notes, she has it on the calendar. Uh, th this has enough truthiness to it, to use the Colbert term, that I believe it. So expect a Nintendo Direct soon, which might also coincide with the official announcement of that Tactors Ogre remake, because I doubt that is Sony only, and Squaresoft has really been supporting these Nintendo Directs lately. So I wouldn't be surprised if you got the official Tactics Ogre announcement at that Direct. One final story before we get into new releases. I'm kind of excited for this, believe it or not. This is from The Hollywood Reporter. Duke Nukem Movie and the works from Cobra Kai creators. I'm not excited for a Duke Nukem Movie. I'm excited for a Duke Nukem Movie made by the people who made the excellent Cobra Kai. Duke Nukem, the 1990s video game that helped popularize the first-person shooter genre, ah, did it, is getting the full feature treatment. Legendary Entertainment, the company behind Dune and the Godzilla movie series, has picked up the movie rights from Gearbox with Cobra Kai creators Josh Harold, John Hurwitz, and Hayden Schlossberg on board to produce. Legendary also produced for Jean-Julien Barant of Marlow Studios, which specializes in the video game adaptations. Oh, G Legendary will also produce, as will Jean-Julien Barant of Marlow Studios, which specializes in video game adaptations. Harold Hurwitz and Schlossberg are producing via their banner, Counterbalance Entertainment. Cool. Uh, Duke, Nukem Duke Nukem movie coming from the Cobra Kai people. Awesome. Sounds great. Be very interested to see how they do that. The Cobra Kai team has shown themselves to be very adept at taking long, dormant, and kind of a joke franchises and turn it into something really good. Cobra Kai, for example, has no business being nearly as good as it is. Really looking forward to this. That kind of does it for the news that I wanted to talk about anyways this week. Let's talk about some new releases, and this is a very exciting week for me anyways. It's all smaller stuff, but I'm looking forward to all of it, or most of it. First up, The Hand of Merlin. This comes on PlayStation, Xboxes, PC, and Nintendo Switch. The Hand of Merlin is a turn-based roguelite RPG in which Arthurian legend meets with sci-fi horror. Recruit mortal heroes to explore lands rife with otherworldly evil, make narrative-bending choices and unique interactive encounters, and search for the lost fragments of your soul across the multiverse. This looks a little budget, but goddamn, though, I love the idea of Arthurian legend combined with sci-fi horror. I, I'm in. I'm sold. Uh, it is a roguelike tactics game, and I will be streaming that sometime this week. Not sure when, but if you want to know when I go live, of course, follow and turn on those notifications. Also coming up, a game I'm looking forward to, Starship Troopers Terran Command on the PC. Starship Troopers Terran Command is a thrilling real-time strategy game set in the Starship Troopers movie universes, not the book, the movie. Take command of the mobile infantry and do your part in the war against the arachnid threat. Ensure that human civilization, not insect, dominates the galaxy now and always. 
this kind of has some it does look a little bit like a uh, an overglorified turret defense game because it's just wave of bugs coming at bunkers however it is made by the same people who made that battlestar galactica deadlock game that is an awesome strategy game albeit it kind of runs a little bit like a hog but I'm really looking forward to see if they can't bring that level of uh, tactical depth to Starship Troopers, of all things. Go figure. Plus, Starship Troopers, what's not to love? Probably the biggest game coming out this week, and I'm really excited for this. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Shredder's Revenge on the PC, PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and Nintendo Switch. Shredder's Revenge reunites the four turtles as they kick shell in the beautiful realized beat-em-up. This is essentially another Turtles in Time. With music from the Wu-Tang Clan, of all things. They did announce, I think, today or yesterday that they did some of the music for it. Uh, at least some of the members of the Wu-Tang Clan. Up to six people co-op beat them up. God damn, I am looking forward to playing this. I loved the old arcade Ninja Turtles game. And I am really looking forward to this. It's also the 80s Ninja Turtles. So with Krang, Shredder, uh, Yellow Jumpsuit, April O'Neil, Casey Jones. You know that... Uh, poor ass batman that works at a big five rather than being a millionaire i am really really looking forward to this game also coming out this week neon white on the pc neon white is a lightning fast first person action game about exterminating demons in heaven you are white an assassin handpicked from hell to complete with other demon slayers for a chance to live permanently in heaven the other assassins seem familiar though did you know them in a past life this is late stylized as a speed run first person shooter so the people who want to get their levels the fastest as seemingly possible this is meant to appeal to them. Uh, I, I'm sure that it will have its its audience, but that I, I can't get over its art style. I don't like it at all as far as its art style goes, so I probably won't be taking a look at it. Plus, it's just not my kind of game. I don't like speedrun first-person shooters for the most part. Finally, you have Red Out 2 on the PC. The fastest racing game in the universe, Red Out 2, is a tribute to classic arcade racing games and the sequel of the critically acclaimed Red Out. Reach impossible speeds and exhilarating futuristic races across an extensive single-player campaign and competitive multiplayer. This is Wipeout. You've played Wipeout. You know what Wipeout is? This is Wipeout. So if you like Wipeout, you might like Red Out. Give it a look. That does it for new releases, which means that does it for the show as well. This has been Game Points Episode 314, and thank you all for showing up and putting up with my voice as it gets drier and drier as we go through it. I don't know what it is today. If you like what you saw here and you want to support the stream, you know what to do. Follow the notifications, turn on bits, subs. There's a Discord you can join. You can follow the show at Game Points PC, myself on Twitter at CapitalistPig21. A myriad of ways you can support the show, regardless if you're watching here at Twitch TV slash Game Points, where we do stream this live every Tuesday at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, or any of the video hosting sites out there, YouTube, BitChute, Rumble, all that good stuff. I will be streaming many of these games this week. Expect to see Starship Troopers, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and Hand of Merlin, and possibly even some Hearts of Iron 4, because I've gotten back on that train, over the next day or two, and probably lead into next week. Really looking forward to playing all that. Anyways, I think that about does it. This has been Game Points, and until next week, I'm out of here. <laughs>